Okay. I think um, most people who said they were joining are here. So we will get started and uh, if anyone else comes along, I may just pause and do a little little recap. Um, so uh, in case you have just come along, my name is Hannah Morris. I'm an educational psychologist and I'm going to be talking this evening about home learning, in particular concentration and focus. Um, and we're going to talk also a little bit about motivation and uh, all those emotional barriers that sort of get in the way of doing home learning as well. Um, so thank you, I can see some of you have already started popping your children's ages in the comments and the types of special educational needs they may have. If your child doesn't have any special educational needs, that's fine. It's gonna be all useful information hopefully for you as well. Um, just to cover a couple of ground rules too, um, very happy for you to ask any questions, but do try and refrain from using your child's actual name. So maybe child, daughter, son, um, just sort of for safeguarding and to, um, to sort of protect protect them and their identity um, and uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you like if I can't cover everything then I will always respond in the comments afterwards um, just a little bit about the role of an educational psychologist to start with in case you haven't worked with an EP before or come across an EP um, I'm often asked what educational psychologists actually do um, so basically my role is to help adults to understand a child's learning and their behavior their development when things are going really well, what their strengths are, um, but also where they might find something difficult at school. And I do that through a, a process of assessment and consultation, but also observing children in settings as well. Um, and central to my role really is, as well as helping children to, themselves to understand what's going on for them. So we don't want children to self-label. We don't want them to think they're stupid when they're not. Um, and then to have an understand why they might, might find something hard at school. Um, so, so that's really the essence of what I do and then I provide lots of advice for families, for schools in what they can do to help their children. So welcome this evening if you just joined us. Um, I'm going to start now, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. Um, I'm going to be talking and then if you've got any questions do just pop them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so let's begin by thinking a little bit about concentration and focus. Um, often the words concentration, focus, attention, they're all sort of used interchangeably. And I suppose in essence they do really mean the same thing and people interpret them in the same way, but they are slightly different and it's helpful to sort of understand the sort of slight differences between them. So if we start with focus. When we're focusing, we're narrowing down on something in particular. We're focusing just on one particular thing and we're giving it all our thoughts, all our, all our um, processing, everything that's going on in our mind is all about the one thing that we're focusing on. When we talk about concentration, this is our ability to sustain that focus. Okay, So some children can actually um, focus on something, but what they can't do is maintain that focus. They get easily distracted and they're all, off, all over the place. And then we have the attention span, and this is how long somebody can maintain that concentration for. And that's going to vary between children based on um, their age and also how, how their brain is actually wired, their, their neurology. Um, so some children, you know, they can focus, they can, they can concentrate, but their attention span is really fleeting. So it's sort of for a very limited amount of time. So... Um, this obviously has a big impact on learning because if a child has difficulties with their concentration, their attention, um, then it, it's going to make it hard for them to cope in a classroom, but also at home it's going to make it hard for them even just working one-to-one. -one, it can be a real struggle and, um, you know, I know it's one of the, the big, big issues with, with uh, parents and um, when we're helping our children at home, I even have it with, with my kids, um, you know, it, it can be really tough and really challenging to, you know, to, to get them just to sort of be with us and to to concentrate on what they're doing uh, for long enough for them to actually get any learning out of the task. Um, something else I'm often asked by parents is how long should your child concentrate for? Um, so if we have a look at, I know some of you have commented on the age of your children, um, so if we have a little look at what some of those ages are, um, then uh, I can sort of guide you a little bit. But basically, um, in terms of the developmental ability to maintain attention, the research it sort of varies a bit. There's not really one main sort of um, consistent agreement in terms of, yes, this is how long children of this age can concentrate for. But typically, you're looking at two to three times their chronological age. So I can see we've 
We've got people here tonight with children ages all the way from six right through to sort of 13, 14. Um, so um, if your child's at the lower end, perhaps they're, they're five or six, you're looking at them concentrating really between sort of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, for a 10 year old, you're looking at 20 to 30 minutes. And then as they get older and maybe they're, they're a teenager, sort of 14, 15, um, then you're looking between sort of half an hour and 45 minutes. That's what typically um, children are able to do um, as they develop. Um, but obviously we know that when children have additional needs, then um, it, it can, can, can be difficult for them and it can cause problems with that attention and that concentration. So I thought it'd be helpful to look through some of those particular um, special educational needs and how they might, those children might be affected in terms of attention and concentration. And then I'm going to give you some lots of suggestions and ideas of what you can do to help because understanding is really important, but we also want to know what we can actually do to help our children. Hello, if you've just joined us, I can see we've had a few more, more people come along. Um, you're very welcome. Um, I'm talking a little bit about attention, focus, concentration. If you'd like to jot down your child's age and if they have any kind of special education need, do pop that in the comments as well. And as we go through, if you've got any questions, let me know um, and I'll do my best to answer them as we go through. So if we think about some of the specific types of special educational needs that children have and how they might be affected in terms of attention and focus and the reasons why. Um, let's start by looking at dyslexia and dyscalculia. So dyslexia is a specific difficulty. Um, it's, it does not mean the child has general learning difficulties. Children of all intelligence can have dyslexia. And a lot of people don't realise that dyslexia is actually um, a specific difficulty with processing and language and memory. And um, it's the cognitive side of things that affects their reading and their spelling skills. Um, so obviously, in terms of attention and focus, it, it, it can be a big issue. But, but not all children with dyslexia and dyscalculia necessarily have difficulty with attention per se. It's more that their specific learning difficulties and the types of issues that they have cognitively affect their ability to then maintain attention. We'll talk about ADHD in a minute, which is where children literally have a specific difficulty. The way their brain is wired makes it physically hard for them to concentrate. Um, and just to clarify as well, for dyscalculia, it's like dyslexia, um, but it's for maths. Um, it, again, it's, it's the cognitive side of things, um, and um, it, it's very much about a child having difficulty grasping the essence and the concept of number and everything that goes with it. And sometimes children with dyslexia can also have difficulties with maths as well. So why do, do children with these specific learning difficulties struggle with their concentration and focus? Well, one of the main reasons is avoidance. Because they find the learning so hard, they're trying to avoid it. So they might be presenting like they can't concentrate and that they can't maintain attention, but actually what's going on underneath is, is, is I'm trying to avoid it because it's too difficult. Another um, issue that I come across a lot in my work that I think is really overlooked, particularly at schools, um, is, is the, the concept, the, the idea of fatigue. We're not talking about a child just being a little bit tired. We're talking absolute fatigue. We are really, really tired because children with dyscalculia, children with dyslexia, they're being asked to do something they find hard all the time, every day at school, nine to five, when we were at school. Hopefully we'll be back in September. Um, so then they come home and either in the evening after school or at the weekends, you're then asking them to do even more. Um, and so that fatigue makes it so, so hard to continue to, to concentrate and focus. If you think about when you go on a long drive somewhere and after a few hours, you just, you've got to stop, you've got to, you know, take a break because you're just really struggling to concentrate. Sometimes for children with dyslexia and dyscalculia, this is what it can be like. And as I mentioned before, the processing and memory difficulties these children experience um, have an impact on um, concentration and focus because... Um, they find it hard not only to understand what's being asked of them um, because they can't hold it in their mind, but just processing it and making sense of what they're being asked to do. And then when they're doing the task, again, keeping things in mind and working it all out and holding it all together, it's, it's just too challenging. And so it's really hard for them to keep concentrating and focusing. Just have a little sip of water, one moment. So I hope that... Um, 
uh, you're finding this useful at the moment. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about ADHD and sensory processing in a second. If you have any questions, do drop them down in the uh, comments and I will do my best to answer them today. And um, if you, um, uh, if, if I can't cover what you've uh, asked, uh, then I will definitely write in the comments afterwards. This video will be available. It will be on my um, my Facebook page. So um, any questions even after today that you want to ask, just drop them down and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so if we move on now and look a little bit about ADHD. Um, so for children with ADHD, this is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Sometimes they have just the ADD bit, so they, they're not so hyperactive. Um, but essentially the way their brain is wired uh, means that they find it very, very difficult to focus their attention, to um, take to know which elements to focus on at the right time. Um, and to resist those impulses to notice something else or think about something else, um, but also just to, to, to literally to make their minds bring themselves to the task at hand. So when we're thinking about children with, with ADHD, um, one of the things to remember is just because your child might be physically on the go all the time doesn't necessarily mean they're mentally on the go in terms of having lots of energy mentally. Their minds might be whirring all the time, but actually that in itself can, can be pretty exhausting. So one of the reasons they might struggle with their, their concentration is, is because actually mentally they're, they're pretty tired. Um, again, the, the processing and the memory side of things come, come into play um, in a huge way for children with ADHD, that that processing mustn't be, be overlooked because they, they really, really struggle to switch off. They can't just uh, ignore everything else that's going on around them. Um, and they find it really hard to maintain that that focus for sustained periods, and um, even for, for short periods, um, it, it's physically really challenging for them. So when we're asking them to, to concentrate and maintain attention, we need to bear in mind that if they're struggling, they're not necessarily um, being difficult. They're not necessarily um, avoiding uh, or, or trying to, to not do the work. They might literally just be really, really struggling uh, to focus. Um, Something else that's quite interesting for, for children with, with ADHD um, is uh, something that, again, it's, it's not often talked about, um, but it's the, the, the sense of, of time management and children with ADHD having um, the ability to plan ahead and know how much time they've got to do something. So if they're given sort of three weeks to do a project, it gets all left to the last minute, not because all they're, they're sort of trying to be difficult or you know they're being lazy, it's because they really struggle to sense how long they've got to do something and they can't stay with something long enough in the moment to, um, to, to, to really be able to plan and chunk. And so as adults, we need to support them and help them with that. Um, then, of course, we have uh, issues, very common, impulsiveness and sleep. So um, whilst they might be actually, they might be focused for a moment, they might be getting into co concentrating but then they hear something or they think of something and they they lack what's called inhibition. So they can't sort of stop themselves from focusing on that or um, switching over to that. So it's quite hard. Um, that impulsiveness can, get in, impulsiveness can get in the way of their concentration too. Um, and then sleep is, this is a bit of a catch-22 because if we have difficulty with sleep, it really, really does affect concentration. So children who are not getting enough sleep are going to find it harder to concentrate and focus. Um, but equally, sleep is a big issue for children with ADHD, um, also children with autism. So it, it's, a, it's, it's some, more something to be aware of, it's not aware of, it's not necessarily something you can wave a magic wand and fix, um, but, it, but it's about understanding as well and that might be causing them some issues. Okay, so um, moving on now, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. Thinking about the processing and the memory side of things, uh, there's something called working memory, which um, is really important to think about if we're looking at concentration and attention, um, because working memory is something children need to use all the time when they're learning. It's like having a little sketch pad, a little notepad in your head. And the idea of working memory is that your brain holds information it takes in through the senses and it holds it there for a short period of time and then it eventually will store it in the long term if, it's, if, if that information is to go in the long term memory um, or it might be just that, that they need to hold that information short term to be able to do something with it as part of the task or their problem solving. 
And a lot of children with specific learning difficulties have issues with working memory, dyslexia, dyscalculia, ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, all of these things, working memory is, is a common issue. Um, and so what will tend to happen is either um, their, their working memory capacity won't be big enough to keep everything in that they need to hold in place to focus and concentrate, um, or they can hold it, but it disappears too quickly. And it, it can be very frustrating for a child trying to learn and concentrate. The information just keeps disappearing from their mind. Um, and again, that, that affects their, their concentration and focus. In terms of sensory processing, which is um, a big issue for many children who have autism and ADHD, um, again, it's really, really important to consider because um, it, it's distracting in itself. Any sensory processing issues are going to distract your child. So everything from fatigue, hunger, noise, um, visual overload, if, if, if they're the environment at home where they're working, if there's too much going on, if there's too much on the walls, there's too much background noise, um, right from the start they're going to struggle. Um, even things like itching. So if your child is a child who struggles with how, how their clothes feel on their body, um, you know, if, if they're uncomfortable at the start, that's just another thing that's distracting them from, from concentrating. Also, sitting can be a big issue. Um, again, something that not a lot of people realise, but particularly children with sensory processing issues may have issues with poor stability or how they're actually able to sit at a table. Um, and just the effort of having to hold themselves upright um, can distract them, can be hard for them to concentrate. So um, one of the things to, to try and ensure is that your child's feet are flat on the floor, um, but also think about the height of the, the chair and the table. It's not necessarily easy to manage, but it's something to be aware of. And if your child is one that slumps a lot, um, then it's quite possible something is, is going on there um, that's going to make it harder for them to concentrate too. Um, and uh, in terms of who to speak to about all this, that's, that's where your wonderful occupational therapists come in. Um, they're great when it comes to sensory processing and, and any issues, you know, in terms of um, child's coordination and, you know, being able to hold themselves up just to be able to, to get on with their work. So um, I'm just going to pause for a moment, just have a look and see if we've got any, any particular questions to ask that have been asked. Um, so let's have a look. We've got... Um, Lack of confidence and how to incentivize. Yeah, we are going to come on to that a little bit later when we talk about emotional barriers. Um, so just just stay with me for a little bit longer for that. Um, the, the children that are perfectionists, we've got someone who said their child's a perfectionist, um, thinks he can't do it. Again, this is all about emotional barriers and we will be talking about this. Um, okay, so someone's asking about um, someone who has dysgraphia and spends a lot of time um, playing computer games. So um, they're uh, doing more sort of gaming um, and having fun rather than actual uh, work. Um, I'd say that probably links in with a bit more motivation, which again is something we're, we're going to look at next um, before we talk about those emotional barriers. If you have any other questions, do drop them in into the comments. Um, what I will do is I'll try and answer them um, on this Facebook Live, and if I can't, then um, I will uh, reply to everybody's comments and questions afterwards because this will be available on my Facebook page afterwards. So in terms of concentration and focus and some of the things we've talked about already, what can we do to help our children when they're struggling? And what I say is a lot of these strategies um, are benefit, be, will benefit all children, um, but obviously that we're talking a lot about children who've got special educational needs, so some of these have... have uh, suggestions based with, with those sorts of children in mind. So the first thing is, and this is always the first thing I say, it's that is the the big one. It's little and often. Um, you may be doing this already. Um, if you're not, start saying it little and often. Um, we we know from from research that children find it easier to to learn to remember information if they learn in shorter chunks than in a long period so we're talking three lots of 20 minutes with breaks in between rather than a solid one hour um, and and whilst we're thinking about that little and often it's really important that we're alternating that sitting still that focus with some physical movement um, it's really really important to get yourself moving around get your child moving around um, and uh, ideally get them outside some fresh air um, but certainly you know moving their bodies getting away from the, the where they have been learning to have that break and then come back to it um, if your child does have particular difficulty um, with attention and focus 
then something you can do is practice paying attention in the same way that if your child struggles with reading you practice reading skills um, we, we can actually practice paying attention with our children so some examples of things you can do um, you can do something called a picture stare where you look at a picture together and you just really really try and focus on the picture talking and discussing it about uh, discussing about the picture um, maybe set a one minute timer and then challenge yourself next time can you do it for two minutes really 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 focusing you know what's interesting in that picture what do you see and for children who, who really struggle to engage um, if it's a picture of something they're interested in that's gonna going to help them um, listening games are great particularly for those auditory processing those working memory skills um, so maybe listening to music and, and what instruments can you hear or, or going outside for a walk and, and just talking about what you can hear and really pausing and trying to, to spot and hear all the different sounds um, and then another little game you can play is the one minute guessing game. Um, this is quite a favourite in our house. Um, basically, everyone has to close their eyes. Someone sets a one minute timer and you all have to say when you think one minute has passed. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting to see how, how everybody judges that sense of time a bit differently. Um, fidget toys can be helpful with concentration and focus. But just be careful because sometimes they can also become distracting too. So you know your child, you know what's going to work for them. Um, but if you know they they're holding a bit of blue tack and actually they're focusing for a little bit longer, even if it's a couple of minutes, then let them. Um, because if you know anything that that helps is um, it is worth it. Um, lots of gentle visual and verbal prompts. And when we're prompting our children to engage, so we're working with them, we're trying to keep them on task. Um, we're going to, tr going to try to um, show an interest and focus their interest rather than criticising. So we're looking to sort of say, oh, oh, look, look, look at this. And oh, I've just seen this and I've just noticed that rather than come on, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and following on from that, the, the messages we, we want to give when our children are struggling with concentration are positive messages. So. We're trying to encourage them what they should do, telling them what to do rather than what not to do. So it's the difference between um, instead of saying, you know, stop doing that, stop looking over there. It's, you know, come and look over here. Can you use your eyes to, to look at this piece of paper? Can you listen with your ears um, to what I'm going to say? Um, you can teach memory techniques, so we know that memory affects concentration, um, and you can build things like working memory. Um, the evidence in terms of how much that will affect their, a child in their all their learning experience is, experiences is still very much um, being being looked at. There's not really a strong evidence in terms of long term and, and across all the areas, but certainly in terms of doing it the specific activity, children can improve their working memory skills on specific programs. So it's something that you might want to consider. Um, also teaching children different types of memory techniques. Um, so, you know, the pairs game, for example, visual memory, any, anything that involves sort of memory activities, all those sorts of games and things can only help. Okay. If you're working with your child, um, then, um, Something else to try and do is use those visual aids because visual aids are not just sort of a, they're talked about so much that sometimes I think that people think, oh, visual aids, okay, visual aids. But actually, they're really, really important because what they do is they help to reduce the pressure on a child's brain for processing and remembering information. So anything you can do, and you don't have to prepare in advance, you know, do loads of stuff, but literally just while you're there, just a pen and a piece of paper, jotting down keywords, drawing symbols and images, anything that's going to help um, provide a visual reference. You're almost sort of taking that sort of working memory and putting it visually in front of your child. Try to display patience and calm. It's really hard to do when we're a parent and we're, you know, we desperately want to help our child and we're trying really, really hard and we're giving so much and yet they're just bouncing off all the walls. Um, but the problem is anything other than patience and calm is just going to make it worse. Um, so take a moment for yourself, your own calming, whatever calming needs, a bit of, you know, deep breaths, a few moments away and then come back. You're going to be more effective in that sense. Um, expectations as well are really important because um, 
you know, you, you come here tonight and, and I hope that you're finding this interesting and helpful in terms of understanding why children might find concentration and focus difficult, as well as what you can do about it. But one thing I want to say is, um, instead of having an expectation of, I want my child to be able to focus and concentrate as would be normal and expected for their age, particularly if your child has a special educational need, you need to shift your expectation to cope and manage because otherwise you're going to be asking them and expecting them to do something that they, they're probably just not capable of because of how their brain is wired, not because they're being naughty, not because you, you're a bad parent, it's just how their brain is wired. So shifting the focus to how can I help my child cope and how can I help them manage um, it is a much better mindset to be in. Um, another thing you can try is some hand signals for calm or slow down, um, you know, discuss it with your child in advance. It'll just, again, another way of prompting your child and bringing them back in. If they don't respond to what you're saying, you know, or something that's on the table already, a hand gesture is a, is a really good way to sort of grasp their attention with a gentle tap on the shoulder and a hand gesture. Um, you could try visual timers, so a sand timer, or sometimes you can get, um, are on and um, get programs that you can put on an iPad where a, a, a timer is set and it shows it visually. So it's like a like a loads of bars and they sort of gradually decrease. So your child can really see how much time they've got left to do a task, which not only helps them to to sort of get on with it and manage the time, but also takes that pressure off because they know actually I'm not going to have to do it for like the whole morning. I'm just being asked to do it for this certain 15, 20 minutes at a time. And then as we mentioned, sensory processing issues before. Um, something that's really important is to do a sensory check before you start. So, you know, is there anything that your child's feeling uncomfortable about? Are they itching? Are they leaning? Are they hungry? All those things. Make sure you've got a bottle of water there. Um, we, want, we want to start off. We don't want to make it even harder for ourselves to begin with. Okay. So, we've talked a lot about concentration and focus. Do keep posting your questions. Um, if uh, if you have any, and I will do my best to answer them. Are there any more? <clears throat> okay. So moving on now, we're going to talk a little bit about motivation and engagement. Um, and somebody asked a question before um, that related to this. Let me just see if I can find what the question was. So um, somebody was asking. Sorry, just one moment. Oh uh, yeah, um, about if you've got a child dysgraphia and they are spending a lot of their time on the computer games um, rather than actually doing the work and it's hard to pull them away from it. This is where motivation comes into play. Um, there is something called external motivation and something called internal motivation. So external motivation is where um, we are motivated to um, uh, achieve through... Um, through ways where we're going to get um, uh, public approval, maybe. Maybe we want to achieve a medal or maybe we want to, to be the best at something. Um, whereas internal motivation is much more about our motivation because of what we're getting out of the task, because we're enjoying it or we're getting some kind of satisfaction. So when it comes to your children, the, the first thing to think about with regards to motivation is what is their motivation? And actually, things they do... Um, uh, when they're not doing the home learning is actually going to give you a lot of insight. Um, so, for example, if your child's doing something like playing computer games um, or, or anything anything that they do, what, whatever it is your child would choose to do, if they could do anything, what would they choose to do? Um, even if you think it's unhealthy, they're choosing to do it because they're getting something out of it. And whatever they're getting out of it, that's your starting point for understanding their motivation. And sometimes um, it's about feeling a sense of self-calm. Sometimes it's about having a sense of predictability, depending on whatever their, their individual needs are. Um, sometimes for computer games in particular, it's about um, their ability to feel success. Because in a computer game, you can, you can practice and, and move up levels. And sometimes the way they're designed, um, as well as being addictive, they're designed in a way that you, you keep going. And sometimes they make certain levels easier so they can then... Um, uh, um, build up and, and uh, progress quite quickly and then that child's getting that sense of achievement so just have a think about what it is your child does that, that they choose to do and what it is they're getting from that um, particular activity and what you need to try to do is to find ways to 
give them that experience, that sense of satisfaction, calm, control, whatever they're getting from it, in other ways. And to start off with, it's got to be nothing to do with learning. You've got to provide activities where they can get that away from whatever it is they're doing that, that isn't helpful. Um, and then you gradually build the learning into that. Um, something else to think about for motivation is personal goals. Um, why do we ask our children to learn? You know, from a child's perspective, why am I being asked to learn? What what am I getting out of this? What, what's the purpose? What's the reason? Um, and having those conversations with the child and, and thinking and planning personal goals for them can be can be really helpful in thinking then about motivation because you can draw your child back to their own personal goals um, in, in how you motivate them. Um, something else to consider about motivation is that um, for some children, um, they need a lot of variety um, to, to be motivated, to, to engage and to concentrate. They need lots of wow moments, lots of excitement, things to be really, really different, fun and creative. Other children, such as those who have autism, might need a lot of consistency. They might need things the same. So that's something else to think about. So in terms of how we help children to be more motivated and engaged, um, then we might think about their preferred learning style. So um, do they learn better through through looking at information, through listening, through talking? Um, you know, if your child is a talker and, and likes to chat about things, then they're going to need you with them when they're doing their home learning because they're going to need to talk through what they're doing. Um, maybe it's kinesthetic. Maybe they like to touch and they need lots and lots of um, concrete materials to, to work with. Um, you can also think about your child's preferred learning approach. So if we're doing... Um, home learning, thinking about when schools are in, typically open and running as normal, um, you know, are we doing home learning after school or are we doing it at the weekends? Does your child prefer to blitz it all and do it in one huge large chunk so that they can get it out of the way and done with because they, they want more time to, to, to relax and switch off? Or do they prefer to do a little bit every day? Um, another great way to, to motivate your child is to think about um, rewarding throughout a task, not just at the end. Um, little incentives throughout, um, and and when we're praising our children, to to think about um, making that praise really constructive, so it's really meaningful, and it's not just oh great, well done. It's actually being very specific about what they're doing. Um, and in terms of um, helping your child to stay engaged, to maintain their, their their focus and maintain their engagement. If you can show a genuine interest in what they're doing, um, asking non-pressurizing questions, um, that's that's only going to help them stay with you, stay with you on the task. Because if they see that you think it's really interesting, um, that's going to sort of be a really good way of modeling to them and keeping them focused. Um, just going to have a look and see if there's any, any more questions coming through before we move on. Just quickly to touch on emotional barriers. Okay. Um, so we've got more questions about sensory processing um, and some questions about online programs. Um, so again, in terms of um, that question again? Uh, sensory processing and aversion, yeah, I mean, it, because when children have sensory processing issues, it overwhelms them. Um, it, so it's, it's not that they are being difficult, being fussy, um, it's literally overwhelming. Um, and imagine sort of you walked outside and there's a huge hailstorm and you're just like, oh, <laughs> I've got to get, get myself covered up. I've got to get out of the way. I've got to do something because I just don't like being sh completely, you know, hailed upon. Um, it's a bit like that for children who've got sensory processing issues. So they are going to avoid. So that's why doing that sensory check at the start is really important, making sure that they are feeling um, centred, they're feeling calm, nothing's bothering them or distracting them or um, things like that. And then the other question about on online games, it's an interesting one actually, the educational online programmes. Um, I think that really will depend on, on your child. It's, it's, you know, they've got their pros and their cons. Um, for some children, it's a great way for them to learn because they can re they really respond well to, to being online. Um, is there an addictive element? Quite possibly, because we know that there are, you know, majority of computer games have addictive elements um, and it'll probably be about managing how much your individual child can cope with um, so for example I'll give you an example um, my son has Tourette's and we notice that sometimes if he spends a bit too much time on the iPad then his tics will get worse so we're always sort of shifting and, and judging not only how long he's on um, a computer game for but um, 
but the types of, of computer games as well. So I think that's going to be a judgment based on your own individual child. Okay, just to finish off before we go, um, we're going to look at these emotional barriers that I know some of you were asking about before. Um, for me, emotional barriers are huge when it comes to concentration and focus. They, they really are. Um, and it's something that is so important to think about. So um, children can experience all sorts of feelings, all sorts of emotions in relation to their learning. Um, and I'm going to look at sort of three of the most common ones. So the first one is fear. OK, so this is when children are they are scared to do a learning task because they don't want to fail. They've had a bad learning experience before and they, they just try and trying to avoid it because they're scared of it. Um, and sometimes you'll, you'll have, you, you have this fight, flight or freeze. So you have some children who will avoid because they're scared. Um, they'll try and find all sorts of creative ways to get out of doing something. Um, sometimes children will go into fight mode if that's their sort of natural response to something that they perceive as being a threat because for some children learning is a, is a threat um, because it's it, it's a threat to their, their well-being, it's a threat to their happiness and it, it causes a lot of stress for them. So if they're going into fight mode, these are the children who are going to resist, they're going to argue, um, you know, you're going to get a lot of tantrums um, because they're really battling because they just don't want to do it. Um, not because, you know, they're being naughty, not because um, they, they can't do anything, but because it's so hard for them. And then sometimes we get children who go into freeze mode and it's just all about the panic. Um, it's, you know, and, and all of these emotions are going to affect a child's concentration because they're not just going to sit down and get on and, and focus on it if, if they are, have this huge wall of emotion that, that they experience. And, and sometimes that emotion can come just when the child sits at the table. Just by sitting at a table, being given a worksheet, um, being given a pencil, you know, even before they've even seen what the activity is, or even if it's something you know that they can do, it, the emotions uh, take control. Um, sometimes children experience anxiety. Um, so it's anxiety in relation to learning, but also it can be anxiety in relation to something else. So if your child has autism, autism for example, and they've got sensory processing issues, then um, the anxiety may be coming from that because they're they're really anxious and feeling out of control because of what's going on for them in a sensory way um, but sometimes it's anxiety in relation to the learning um, what are they going to be asked to do how long are they going to be asked to do it for all these sorts of things um, and then finally the the last um, emotion is frustration um, so uh, you know sometimes children will um, be uh, be learning and they'll be giving it a go um, but it just keeps going wrong. They just keep hitting hitting a brick wall. They just keep making mistakes. Um, yet they're being asked to do it again, asked to try again. So like, try hard, try your best. You know, and, and we want we want to encourage our children. Um, but if every time we try, we we find it difficult, we make mistakes, and we get things wrong, it's really really frustrating. Um, and it's hard to then have that motivation to want to to continue. And then in turn. We, we just don't have that will to, to concentrate and focus for very long. So what can you do to help? Um, well, one of the best things you can do is to ditch the worksheets, get away from the table, um, and think about creativity and games. Um, think fun, think laughter, because um, children learn better when they're calm, when they're happy, when they're relaxed. And the best way to, to help them feel those things is through um, having playing games, being creative, doing arts and crafts, having fun together. Um, try and take the approach of explore together rather than I'm here to supervise you doing the work. You know, I'm standing next to you and I'm here to help, but I'm watching you, um, you know, I'm watching you while uh, while you do your work as opposed to we're going to explore together. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to actually start for you. Um, you're going to watch me do it. And then if you feel okay, you feel confident enough, then you can join in and have a go with me. Um, before even asking your child to try something themselves. Um, try to present work in smaller chunks. So either breaking something down, you know, you can cut up. If you are doing worksheets, cut them up. If you've been given an activity by, by school, break it down into lots of small steps. Um, and so you're only asking your child to do one step at a time. Start easy and gradually increase in the challenge. So if you're given um, a piece of work from school and you, you feel actually although the teacher might have differentiated because they know it's something they can do, can you give them something even easier to do to start with, just to get them going, just to start them off with that real sense of confidence? 
as I said before, try to make your praise specific. So it's about what they're doing and how they're doing, not just a general, well, that was great. Um, and in terms of those particular emotions, something else you can do um, when we're not actually focusing on home learning um, is to build up an opposing positive emotion. So for fear, we want to be looking at building up confidence. For anxiety, we want to be giving opportunities for our children to feel satisfied. And for frustration, we want to be promoting calm. Um, and for, for calm and that, that sense of control, mindfulness and listening to music are, are really, really great for that. Um, another little tip is when you start to talk about, you know, we're, we're going to be go, doing something together now, you know, we're introducing the, okay, it's home learning time. Um, rather than we're going to do learning, just start introducing the activity. We're going to play together. We're going to have fun together now. Would you like to come outside with me on the trampoline? Um, or would you like to come and kick a ball around? Or um, shall we, you know, play hide and seek? Anything just to get them involved and then gradually introduce a learning concept through that. So, um, for example, if your child really likes football, then, and you want to work on times tables, then um, doing those kick-ups whilst you're practicing your times tables is going to be much more effective than sitting at a table trying to repeat them and go over them. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking now, um, and uh, I'm going to bring the Facebook Live to a bit of a close. But just before I go, there's one big tip I want to give you all for home learning, and that is to be a parent, not a teacher. Um, it's really hard to do when we want to help our children, but don't worry so much about teaching the curriculum. Don't worry so much about helping your child catch up with everything. Home learning is about practicing and rehearsing and consolidating skills. And if you can be supportive with your child and um, give them those opportunities to do that, to have a bit of a practice, then that's brilliant. Then you're, you're doing a fantastic job. And that is what home learning is all about. Um, so be kind to yourselves um, because you're probably doing more than you even realise, um, whether it's you know working with a child or talking with the school about ways you can help. Um, you know, Don't underestimate the impact you are having on your children. Um, so just before we go, any final questions? Let's have a little look. Yeah, so that, that fear of, someone's been asked about fear of getting work done in the current situation um, with, with COVID and everything. Um, so um, it, it's a very, very difficult situation and a lot of children are going to be experiencing all sorts of emotions which are going to um, really make things that much worse. You know, everything that they may normally experience if they do have a bit of fear or a bit of anxiety it's just compounded it's just so much worse and then we have to throw in a whole a whole load of loss and trauma all those feelings as well um so um i'm actually in the process of developing some um some more online training um uh, it's going to be looking at how we can prepare children for returning to school post covid and dealing with things like trauma and loss um, but as I said, when, you're, when your child has a, has a fear of, of failure, um, really what we need to be doing is giving them lots and lots of experiences of doing things they find really easy and they know what to do. They know how to do it. They're really confident in doing it. And even before we do that in relation to their learning, we want to be doing it outside, nothing to do with learning, anything that they're really good at. And they're helping around the house, um, brushing their own hair, something they've just, just learned to do recently. It doesn't matter how how small it is, but anything that we can really boost their confidence and let them know, you know you're really good at doing that. Um, you know, it's, it, I like the way you, you've done that. And, you know, you couldn't do that a few weeks ago. That's great. And then we can gradually build that language into it when we're doing home learning and starting off really, really easy, getting a child used to sort of doing, doing the task, just engaging, first of all, before we start to int introduce any kind, of, any kind of challenge. And also when we're talking about fear of learning, um, a really good phrase to, to use is instead of um, I'll show I'm going to show you and, and, and you know can you try can you try it's watch me I'm going to do it look listen I'm going to do it first can you try and do it with me is the next thing you say if they can't that's okay then you just go back to modeling because they're still learning by watching you even if they haven't got the confidence to have a go themselves and just keep going through that cycle of demonstrating and encouraging them to join in and then when they've built up a bit more confidence, maybe then they want to have a bit of a go themselves. So that, that sense of demonstration, watch me, look, listen, try, let's try together. And then if they're ready, do you want to have a go by yourself? 
Okay, thank you so much, everybody. I'm so delighted that so many people joined me. I will be honest, I was a little bit nervous at the start. This is my first Facebook Live. Um, my husband often tells me that I shout, so I hope I haven't been shouting at you all. Um, it's something about being on an iPad and, and, and it just affects your voice. Um, but anyway, thank you for, for joining me today. If you've got any questions, do post them in the comments. I will go through later on this evening and answer everybody's questions as best I can. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye.